Okay, so we're back. Uh, now we're doing part seven of Truth Makers. No, wait, part eight of Truth Makers. Uh, for this week, we read a follow up to last week's paper by Josh Parsons. We led, we read, Are There Irreducibly Relational Facts? Which was interesting. Uh, Kenny, you weren't, you weren't with us. Did you have a chance to read that too? No, I skimmed it, but I didn't have a chance to read it. Skimming is good enough. Uh, we, we, we decided we didn't really know what was going on with respect to various topics and decided that this paper, which we read for today, there is no truth maker argument against nominalism, also by Josh Parsons and cited in the other one, might help us out. And I think it does, or at least it helped me. Um, to be honest, I don't remember what we were stuck on last week, but but I think we, we will be able to piece it together. Uh, it, um, mainly, I wanted to know what the deal was with respect to internal relations, intrinsicality, and essentiality. And I think I have a pretty good grasp of how those three come apart now, or rather I should say how they could come apart. And now I've discovered sure, how sure. they don't come apart for Armstrong, at least according to Parsons, and how that puts into relief exactly uh, what the options are for a truth maker or alternatively somebody for somebody who uh, wants to find fault with the truth maker theories, or more to the point, um, somebody trying to evaluate why Armstrong thinks that the development of a truth maker theory will advance uh, arguments regarding universals. So that's what we read. That's that's my thought. Um, how about yourselves, Kenny? Yeah, I mean, it. This was a. Uh... I mean, it seemed like a pretty good paper to me. I don't know that I, um, I mean, I didn't get to read the one last week, but this one stood on its own. Um, and I really, it was impressive how basically what he did was he extracted, uh, like he sort of factored out an argument essentially, right? Like Armstrong gives this argument, um, um, which purports to be a truth maker argument against nominalism. And uh, Parsons kind of shows how, well, this is really because Armstrong has certain views about how these concepts, like you said, you know, uh, internal relations and, and uh, essentiality and so on, um, for him uh, collapse and that, you know, and that creates uh, a certain kind of argument, but would, but there's, but the content, which really provides the force of the argument could almost be factored out. And that's what he does in, uh, in bringing out the essentiality aspect um, of that argument, the, uh, the Leibnizian essentialism. Um, and I thought that was, I mean, I, I thought that was pretty good. I mean, I, um, I'm still hoping to get a bigger, a, a better grasp on those three concepts, the internal relations, intrinsicality and essentiality and how they, how they differ so that I can get a better feel for why some people say they go together versus other people say they come apart. I, I think I'm starting to get it, but it's still not fully clear to me. So I hope that's one thing I hope to get out of this. Um, but I don't think I had any like, you know, super substantial, uh, you know, disagreements with this particular paper. Um, well, yeah. Um, Josh, uh, tr try, try to extend your introduction to give Karen a chance to come back. <laughs> oh no, I thought just your video went down. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. I, I was having a lot of problems getting this sound of Kenny, so I thought turning the video off might help. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I thought this was it was a good philosophy paper. I really love how concise it was. It was well argued for. Um, it's easy to follow. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think what motivated this reading last week was the distinction he was placing between his theory of truth making, which was non-essential, with the the sort of wrong version, which he called truth making essentialism. And we just went back and forth about what that could mean, what the difference might be, how it was important. Um, and so this paper, he's, he's really telling us the, the difference. Yeah, um, now we know, right? Yeah. <laughs> do we? <laughs> I think we, I think, I mean, we'll know, we'll find out, right? But I think we did. I, I, I mean, I, I just have so many 
auxiliary questions then with, with this distinction. Um, there's, there's just a lot to think about. And then I, I didn't really consider bringing in my, my own nominalistic leanings um, here. I mean, I knew obviously it was going to play a role in what, what the truth makers would be, but, but maybe not in which truth maker theory, because everything we read so far, they're like, bring your favorite truth maker. It doesn't matter. Everything I'm saying is still going to hold. Um, he's kind of saying, well, actually, <laughs> maybe on you know Armstrong's account, like you, you can't be anomalous, but actually maybe you could be because he's arguing a little bit stronger than he needs to, and he's losing out on, you know, maybe the so yeah, this was a, a really interesting subtlety that we hadn't covered before. Um, and I think it's it feels sort of empowering, and I'm still dealing with the, the repercussions and, and what, what that might mean. Um, and also thinking about the, the weaker form of nominalism, which I would place myself in, um, which include you know things like tropes. Um, that's that's sort of my camp. So I hadn't realized I was in a, a bit of opposition with Armstrong. So um, now I know when I read Armstrong, I, I kind of have this in my back pocket. If I feel like he's arguing too strongly against my position, I might have some wiggle room, which is which is nice. But as of right now, I'm not fully grasping the impact and and some of the the essential points. I'm, I'm feeling intuitions pushing back on. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping maybe by the end of this, I'll have maybe a little bit stronger feelings about it. It's so funny, Karen, when you came on, I felt like I was doing like this. Ah, okay. I can open both eyes now. <laughs> what did you think of this? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I also, I guess I have to phrase the short papers. They're much you know very targeted very well structured i enjoyed that um i do see that this helps us get a grasp on the distinction he was making last week between intrinsic and essential and i think that it's a pretty as he sets it out it's a pretty useful distinction and intuitive enough um and i think i saw his points again against armstrong though i feel like and i didn't have time unfortunately to go back and look at the armstrong because i seem to remember armstrong Oh, my, my audio is scary off. I'll try turning off the video. Um, I seem to remember Armstrong relying on contingency quite no, a bit. No, it's the same. You may as well keep the video theories. on. <laughs> um, and so I'm just, your mic rubbing on something? Uh, or you have like three tools like under your desk? I, it, it sounds like your mic is having like a little farting session or something. It's really kind of weird. Okay. <laughs> I'll try using just the computer. I'll try just the computer instead of... Maybe you could call in from, right, from Peru see, like that last now? time. Can you hear me at all? No, we hear you fine. It's just really weird, distracting. No, well, anyway, I can't you'll, hear you you'll... guys. Let's see here. All right. Can you hear better? Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah, we'll just go. It's okay? All right. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, maybe maybe at at and you blame the fire. Um, it's just been a really bad internet week for Oh man. Um, yeah, so heavily relied on the idea that certain truths were contingent. No. It's the weirdest <laughs> it's, it's just a it's just a constant background noise. Perhaps it could be factored out of the audio. I have no idea, but it's, oh, of course uh, not. I'm no expert at this stuff. I don't know anything. Um I, I don't you have headphones? Are you using headphones? I just took them out because you said it was making a weird noise. Oh, I guess that wasn't it. I guess that wasn't the problem. Mm. Mm. Oh, well, those headphones. I tried have... different headphones. Hmm. Okay, don't worry about it. it we'll, we'll just we'll stop laughing. <laughs> 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 oh, no promises. <laughs> All right, I'll go get different headphones. Talk amongst. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, fine. Selves. Well, let's just let's just start on the paper and um, yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So. Um, well, why did you guys want to read this paper? What was it about last time that that really that led you guys to this paper? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I'd have to. Was look. it? I think it was. Um, the last paper had something to do with internal relations. Uh, right, um, yes. and some some dispute between. I don't know. There was something about Russell there was and a Bradley, and there was a particular paragraph that I was yeah. trying to make sense of, and on yeah. which the whole paper turned. 
Mm. And um, let's see if I can find that. Well, we're, we're trying to grasp the distinction between the intrinsic properties and the essential properties and, and how far his argument went, like what, what exactly his, his target was. So we had the Australia example of the location of the cities. Um, and if the locations have been different, it would still be Australia. Like the, what would the truth make uh-huh. be? And it just seemed like too much hinged on a distinction we didn't. Was this like Cambridge chain like properties or whatever? Yeah, there were relational like uh, positional properties. Um, not being um, essential. And so various accounts of truth making would, would fail if essentialism was necessary. Um, but we, he just wasn't saying enough about this in, intrinsic versus essential distinction. And it seemed so important to his argument. Yeah. Let me just read the paragraph out loud. It's, it's on 219 of the Lao Anthology. Uh, he says, Making true is a slightly more contentious concept to pin down. I have argued elsewhere in the paper we just read that X makes P true if it only if X is, if and only if X is intrinsically such that P. To put this another way, a duplicate of X cannot exist without P being true. And yet a third way, P cannot become false without a non-Cambridge change in X. Many truth maker theorists hold, however, that every fact essentially makes true all and only those truths that makes it true. That's oh, right, that it makes true. A doctrine I call truth maker essentialism. This leads them to define making true thus. X makes P true, if and only if X is essentially such that P. To put this another way, a counterpart of X cannot exist without P being true. And yet a third way, P cannot become false without the destruction of X. So now, if Canberra's being south of Sydney, um, depends only on Sydney and Canberra, uh, then it can't be an internal relation. And the whole paper was about whether uh, relations can all be internal, because if there are any external relations, then the truth makers cannot be just a matter of the relata, cannot be made true just by the relata, right? Oh, I see, okay. So, Parsons' solution is to make the truth maker of the truth that Canberra is south of Sydney be Australia, where Australia is intrinsically such that those two cities have that south uh, southward relation. Right. But then... It would only be a truth maker for that relation uh, if truth maker essentialism were true. And I think Parsons just doesn't like that for some reason, I don't remember. Well, if intrinsicality and essentiality don't, or essentialism don't come apart, then the locations of, of Sydney and Canberra must be essential to Australia. And that doesn't seem like- Oh, that's right. what he doesn't like. Yes, right. right. He doesn't want to say that it is essentially the case that Canberra is out of Sydney. Right. So Australia becomes the truth maker that has an intrinsic property that makes true the propositions about their locations. But if by accepting that you have to accept essentialism, then you can't get all the sort of, you know, obvious counterfactuals, like if they're in different places, uh, everything else that would follow would, would sort of fall apart. Um, so it seems to conflate too much. So that's why he makes the distinction that he wants a, uh, um, uh, what does he call it? I guess internal truth making versus- No, he just wants the truth maker principle without truth maker essentialism. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and this so has the effect, and this has the effect in the other paper that there are no irreducibly relational facts or something like that. Is that the idea? If essentialism is true, then there then are. Then there would be. Yeah. Irreducibly relational facts. That's right. Yeah. Yes. yes. Which I'm not sure why that would be a f- problem. I've already forgotten. Um, well, it wasn't a problem for you. <laughs> yes, no, I know. I mean, that's why it's difficult to remember, but I'm not sure who it was a problem for and why. Uh, um, I think because of his nominalism, he wants a leaner ontology without just purely relational. Oh, facts. right. Not admitted relations. Duh. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because even if you admit tropes, it wouldn't include 
uh, relations. Right. Yeah. So I was pushing back on the last. I week. see. But with this, with this clarification understood now, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I think, more in agreement with, on the first paper with him now. Um, mm. So it's very interesting. Yeah. So intrinsicality without essential it's essentialism. Um, but that one, the one footnote by Armstrong scares me because <laughs> he said that he's, he said that Parsons wasn't appreciating um, his uh, counterpart theory, and that wasn't fully unpacked. And so I'm, I'm kind of concerned that maybe Parsons isn't appreciating that. But at the same time, Parsons isn't appreciating that. Whoa! Just heard myself. Um, well, I, I heard, heard you yourself heard, too. I heard you twice too. It's <laughs> probably Karen's fault. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, it's my fault. Was that my counterpart? Oh my god. I mean, yeah. we don't know. We don't have to blame Karen. Line. We can blame AT and T of Danville. Yeah, you can blame AT and T of Danville. Is that better now? Yeah, I think yeah. so. What did you do? Okay. Oh, I just called in. So yeah, I think phone. calling from Peru is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like yeah. It might sound like I'm at the bottom of the well, and I only have two bars, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then, um, what Parsons tries to do is give us yeah um, I mean it's it's not it's a nicely structured paper because it gives you the historical motivation, lays out a few different uh, premises, each with a little story and then has the core argument in that triad. Um, maybe we could go there and build out from there instead of going sequentially, what do you think? As long as sometime we talk about bearded worms, I'm fine. <laughs> well, considering you brought bears and mats, I hope you didn't bring worms. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't think I, I have a banana slug somewhere, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe we shouldn't start there. I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure how to tackle this. Uh, let me just read the triad since I didn't mention it. So the first is there is contingency in the world. Um, one way to understand that is to say a certain rose might not have been red, but yellow. I might have been taller than I am and so on. So that's, I suppose, a premise we pretty much all accept, uh, including Parsons and Armstrong and whoever else is involved. Two, Leibnizian essentialism. All intrinsic properties are essential ones. So this is a attractive theory, but it's not a popular one. It's not accepted by Parsons, uh, but it is by Armstrong. I don't know if it's explicitly so accepted by Armstrong, but Parsons seems pretty convinced of his interpretation. And then the, um, and we'll talk about what that is. And the third one is thoroughgoing nominalism, which he makes clear is not merely denying properties and relations, but also things like tropes and uh, states of affairs and any of the other kind of uh, moderate uh, substitutes for full-blown universals that attempt to do the work. Thoroughgoing nominalism would be, there are only concrete things. Uh, there's the rose, not the redness of the rose, just the rose. And you can't have all three is basically what this is all building up to. And so what uh, Parsons basically points out is that you can give up on two. You can give up on the uh, Leibnizian essentialism and still uh, be nominalistic. Um, and have a truth maker account. He doesn't actually tell us how to do this, but he cites a few people who are at least trying. The main thing though, is to show that Armstrong's case against nominalism doesn't seem to be based on uh, whatever it is that he needs to build up a truth maker theory, but rather just on this Leibnizian essentialism, which is a subtle point, but definitely worth exploring as it seems to separate us all of us, uh, with respect to how to, deal about, how to deal with modality, which reinforces a point I've been making, I think many of us have been making all along, which is that how to ultimately tackle the truth maker problem 
is going to depend on how we deal with the modality problem. This, this might be getting in too deep too fast, but I wonder if, I'm, I'm starting to remember, I think, Armstrong's views on contingency and what makes it true that the rose might have been yellow. And doesn't he say something like, it's the fact that the rose's color is contingent in this world that makes claims about counterfactual true. Not that there's some rose, some counterpart of the rose in some other possible world, right? The claim that the rose is yellow in some other possible world, if that's made true, it's by this world and the particular kind of property that red is. So it sounds like on Armstrong's view, he could have essential properties that are nonetheless not necessary properties, right? They're somehow essential to the, the thing that it is, <laughs> as it is, but they're yeah, that, completely contingent. Yeah, that's the whole point. That's the whole right? point. They're there not, are no contingent properties, um, but there are things that no, seem there are to contingent be like, properties. No, 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 I, I get it, I get it. There are no intrinsic contingent properties. Um, there are no, contingent no, no, properties. there are intrinsic conditions. They just have to also have to be essential. Because, I don't know, it's a weird way of using essential, but they're not, but essentiality can't be, go look at other possible worlds because other, there aren't other possible worlds. Well, let me, let me just say what I was going to say. You might agree with it. Uh, I'm just not sure. I, I just, I'm just not sure. Um, my reading is he, that Armstrong is saying there are no um, intrinsic contingent properties um, and contingent properties are really just um, relations to these states of affairs you've just described, these extra properties in the actual world that are would ground our saying that the red rose might have been yellow. No, I don't know that relations come into it. Um, I just think it's that there are some properties that are contingent and some properties that are necessary. And the question of whether or not something is intrinsic or essential is a separate question. So that you can have contingent and yet essential properties, which is weird, but I think possible. Um, yeah, so then I, I'll have to go back and see if that makes any sense, um, given what he says on essentialism. But I, yeah, I, I think the Armstrong that we read didn't even use that. It was like truth maker necessitarianism and truth paper minimalism were the stuff that he was talking about. So I'm not sure where the essential comes in. Well, the but Armstrong we can, that we can work the Armstrong it. the Armstrong that we read, I don't recall um, brought out the distinction between thin and thick particulars. Um, yeah, no, and I don't so think it could just be that what we read was from a different uh phase of his work or maybe it just wasn't relevant to what he was writing at the time I don't, i'm i'm not sure but that was an aspect which seemed quite important uh in this paper um of armstrong's philosophy that i don't think we'd encountered before so i don't i don't know how that all lines up at the development of his thoughts so this this particular paper is 2006 no 99 99 so this paper is 99. So this paper is before the book, right? The Truthmaker book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Armstrong, yeah. Armstrong's, yeah. Not bad much, five years. Yeah, sure. But my, my, my point is just that perhaps Armstrong, perhaps the article we read by Armstrong is a slightly more considered view after this paper. It's right? possible, yeah. Yeah, so I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm just not sure. OK, okay. Uh, well, what do you well, mean? Anyways, or... actually, the, the Armstrong he cites is from 78, right? <laughs> so decades. It's a long time. That's a long time. Yeah. 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 yeah so it's a paper called Nominalism and Realism, or actually maybe a book. That was a book, yeah. Yeah. And the theory of universals was also 78. That's right. And the materialist theory of mind was 68. <laughs> oh my Ooh. God. 
Yeah. It's even earlier. Yeah. I mean, okay, Armstrong okay, but, okay, lived but, to be but in the, his nineties. So but the opening, was productive his whole life. <laughs> but the opening sentence is of a recent form. The opinionated introduction. Yeah. That is 89. Well, 89. No, <laughs> it's newer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ish. yeah. Yeah. Uh, he also the, he also says the newest thing is world of yeah affairs. yeah that's the newest thing yeah the world of states of affairs yeah I'm sure it's probably current enough um, yeah whatever he's, he's responding to anyway um, what do you make of the truth maker essentialism now <laughs> like uh, the the implication in the two Parsons papers is that uh, many people go for it some don't even bother to to single it out as a distinct distinctive premise. Um, but it, well, he thinks it ought to be. I, um, I accept it. I didn't bother to think about it before, so I guess I fit that description. And now that I'm thinking about it explicitly, I appreciate his pointing it out. But I accept it anyway. So I wonder, I wonder how you feel. Just, just to orient me in the conversation. So I mean, I guess we should say what the what the difference is, right? What 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 more is there to truth maker essentialism than uh, the uh, so, truth maker principle? So, well, actually, I, I'd rather not call it truth maker essentialism. Of course, he does, but it's really about intrinsicality. Sure. And 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 then that, of course, will come to be the issue, right? Uh, should we go from intrinsicality to essentialism, or exactly how do you does how do you do, how does he do that? Right, because. That's important, right? That Parson distinguishes between intrinsicality and essentialism. Right. So, um, so basically, the idea is just that if you accept this stronger truth maker principle, um, you think that the truth makers make what they make true on account of their intrinsic properties alone. That's it. So I, I put it in terms of intrinsicality. Now, how you get that, how you get from there to essence, I think is the heart of this paper. I suppose the way to do this is to consider the beacon and the, the rose, right? Mm -hmm. So the rose gives it to us by way of uh, modality and the beacon by way of temporality. If, if, a, if a red rose makes the sentence, this is a red rose, true, uh, then I forgot to have to read it. What's this? Okay. In another possible world, that very rose exists and is yellow. In that world, the rose does not make true. This rose is red, but instead makes true this rose is yellow. Similarly, a certain beacon takes the form of a light that alternates between glowing red and glowing green. When it is red, it makes true the sentence, the beacon is red, but when it becomes green, it stops making this sentence true and starts making the beacon as green is true. But both of these are incompatible with what he calls truth maker essentialism. Uh, for according to this, making true is not the sort of thing you can stop or start doing either over time or between possible worlds. So Armstrong tries to make the case uh, that uh, it does work. He says, it seems evident enough if we consider for a moment the idea that the truth-making relation should be external, contingent. If it is said that the truth-maker for a truth could have failed to make the truth true, then we will surely think that the alleged truth-maker was insufficient in itself and requires to be supplemented in some way. Conting a contingently sufficient truth-maker will be true only in circumstances that obtain in this world, 
but then these circumstances, whatever they are, must be added to give the full truth maker. Okay. So, um, I guess the idea is that the yellow rose, uh, or rather the red rose that might have been yellow, um, I'm lost. Uh, help me out here. Okay, can I can I kind of express how I read this and then see if this is how you guys read it? Because it's interesting to me. So this is kind of smeared across the paper and, and in the footnotes, but Armstrong makes a distinction between the, the entities and the properties that it has and the states of affairs. So there's this distinction between the essential relation between the truth maker as states of affairs and the entities as parts of the states of affairs. So the essential uh, aspect of truth making is between the states of affairs and the truth bearer, uh, not between the properties of the entity and the truth bearer. That's just an intrinsic relationship. And that's how Armstrong gets around it. And I, if that's right, that's, that was very interesting. And then I wasn't sure how Parsons was arguing against, against that. It just seems like a different account of, like a different account. But that's why I wasn't sure if I had that right, because it seemed like he wasn't arguing against that really. Um, so I was a little confused on that on that point. Because it, it seems like for Armstrong, the, the uh, um, intrinsic nature and the essential nature do come apart when you introduce this, you know, whatever states of affairs are for Armstrong, which are different than what I take Parsons to be talking about. Does that sound? Right. Yeah, I think that that captures my memory of Armstrong, that it was something like, there's a state of affairs of the rose being red. And that is essentially, or in, maybe even that state of affairs in, is intrinsically or essentially or everything connected to the truth of the sentence, the rose is red. But it also is a state of affairs that's a contingent matter regarding the rose. It describes a contingent fact about the rose. So there's an essential and intrinsic connection between the state of affairs and the truth but in terms of the connection between red and the rose it's a it's it's a it's a state of affairs that involves a contingency not an essential connection does that make sense yes but then the counter to that is to say that it's um So then, if, if this is a critic, if this is a criticism of nominalism, then I guess it means that you can't have state of affairs be what they need to be for this account to work. If you don't, if you if you merely think that there are just things and not somehow distinguishable, the state of affairs of that thing having a certain property. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I get it now. Well, reason... how is it that this? How is it that the state of affairs? Uh... It essentially um, makes the truth true. Because if you put if you put this state of affairs in any world, you've got a bear on a mat. Yeah. But it's a contingent fact about this bear and this mat that they're connected by being on. Look at that. Right. But nonetheless, when you put this mm -hmm. state of affairs into a world, it, it, essentially you're going to get a bear on a mat in any world that this goes in. But it's a contingent matter. This state of affairs is a contingent state of affairs, because look. Right. Right. So I want my bearded worms. <laughs> um, but maybe we should go through, yeah, go through the I was I was trying to find in the paper where he set out the truth maker principle, so I forgot to underline it. But I think it's John, uh, Parsons sets it out what he means by it on th top of three twenty seven, and it's the truth maker principle for him is simply that every true sentence's truth supervenes on the nature of something, and then um, truth maker essentialism is at the bottom of three twenty eight. According to the truth maker principle, every truth has a truth, truth maker in virtue of which the truth is true, right? Because it supervenes on the nature of some things, as we just heard. According to truth maker essentialism, every truth has a truth maker, which is, which is essentially that truth's truth maker. So if the, if the truth maker is a state of affairs, that's different than if the truth maker is a bear and a mat. 
right? Because they don't essentially, they're not essentially, there's nothing essential about Boris that makes him the truth maker for the bears on the mat. But there might be something essential about this that makes it the truth maker for the bears on the mat. Yeah, so I, the anomalous really... does seem, yeah, have to have a problem if you just get bears and mats and not states of affairs. I understand that why I was confused. Uh, the um, the red rose, if the red rose makes that proposition true, uh, then then it can't essentially do so if it could have been yellow. But if you take a modal realist view, then it's only at a world that it is so true, and so. It's 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 no longer about the essentiality of objects and their counterparts, but rather about the truth making relation itself with respect to uh, objects at worlds. Now that 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 might not work out, but that was the intuition I had. It, I, I've committed what I consider one of the sins of counterpart theory, which is to to use modal. To use modal language once you've translated into possible world talk. So I'm not really sure what to do with that, other than to say that, um, yeah, I have to think about it some more. I'm not even sure where I stand here, other than that none of this really applies to the Lewisian picture, because of course it's just blatantly not nominalist. Um, would it help to talk about bearded worms and, and, and to see the how the truth maker argument was used against behaviorism? And then we can build to how it's supposed to be used against nominalism and see if Parsons is right that it uh, yeah, is not an I, analogous argument. Yeah. Um, so that I guess it seemed that. Um, Armstrong's main target with the help of C.B. Martin was Ryle and um, Ryle's views about dispositional properties um, where Ryle says to possess a dispositional property is not to be in a particular state or undergo a particular change it's to be bound or liable in a particular state or undergo a particular change when a particular condition is realized and so um, to say that um, you know, a person or, you know, glass is, dis is fragile, is disposed to break, is not to make a claim about the state that the glass is in, but what state it would be in if certain conditions arise, right? Like I drop it. Um, and so Armstrong says that this means that they are implying that there's a truth without a truth maker because this glass is presumably fragile now, but I've just said that I'm not attributing any state to the glass now right? Fragility is talking about something that might happen if it's in a situation which doesn't actually obtain, as long as I keep a good grasp on it, right? So th that's where the bearded worms come in. Yeah. Uh -huh. It says, um, it may be true that someone has a belief which is never manifest in their behavioral dispositions, the belief that worms are not typically bearded, for example, which is true. I, I never said anything to that regard my, myself, but I guess I always believe that. Armstrong agreed with Ryle's dispositional view about belief though. It's just that he insisted that there must be some difference in the world, some difference that the disposition makes, which makes it true that at times when the disposition is not being manifested, it would be manifested were we to ask, say, do worms have beards, right? So there's gotta be something um, in true about me now or true about, let's say my, my nephew now, such that if I called him and said, do you think worms always, you know, is it typical that worms have beards? He'd say no, right? <laughs> um, but there's something now true about teeth that if I call him, he'll say that, right? And so you can see how this is a argument against behaviorism because a belief isn't just, you know, that Keith has mentioned how beard, worms don't have beards, right? <laughs> it's that, there's something true about Keith right now. Like there's something, you know, in his brain, in his neurons that he can, that accounts for the fact that he's going to say, no, there, you know, 
Auntie Karen, you're nuts again. Worms are not bearded if I call them and ask. Um, so I don't know. If I asked them that particular question, who knows how you respond to be honest. Because <laughs> it comes so out of left field. But anyway, you get the idea. I had never heard of this argument against behaviorism, and it's amazing. I, I love this. <laughs> Uh, some of the some of the things we've read about, um, like folk psychology being a convenient way of speaking, makes me wonder if this argument can be placed against that as well, because it seems as if there's anything that you could say of someone as a even if it's a convenience uh, way of speaking, it's like, well, no, something must make it true. So if they act in a way as if they have desires, well, what is it that makes it true? Um, oh, you mean like their desire? <laughs> instrumentalism yeah. broadly. Yeah. 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 Right. I think you're right. Okay, so how is a similar thing being wielded against nominalism? And that's on the bottom of 327, right? Uh, accepting that this is Armstrong supposedly directly, accepting the truth maker principle will lead one to reject Quine's view that predicates do not have to be taken seriously in considering the ontological implications of the statement one takes to be true. Consider the difference between asserting that a certain surface is red and asserting that it is green. An upholder of the truth maker principle will think that there has to be an ontological ground, a difference in the world to account for the difference between the predicate red applying to the surface and the predicate green so applying, right? Well, that does make sense. Um, so if, if you were anomalist who said the only thing, um, that could be the truth maker for the truth for the surface is red is the surface. Um, does that mean that it's sort of like you're not you're not giving a fine-grained enough explanation to explain the difference between the surface being red and the surface being green in those two situations. Right, because he says, the point of invoking Quine here is that according to Quine's criterion of ontological commitment, to say there's a red surface commits us to no more things than there is a surface commits us to. To be is to be the value of a bound variable in first order logic and variables ranging over red surfaces range over no more, indeed less than those who range over all surfaces do. I mean, here Parson re responds that Quine is not saying, he says on 328, Quine is not saying, nor need anomalous be saying that there are red roses and not ontologically committing at all, nor that the truth of this sentence makes no difference to the world. Well, yeah, so <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, it's interesting that, so he asks, you know, um, he says, yeah, he says, what is there then to stop us identifying an item in the domain of quantification of the sentence? which we are already committed to by Quine's principle and calling it the truth maker of that sentence. Well, he's going to bring up, of course, the very thing that Quine wants to eschew, right? Uh, which is anything that smacks of essences or universals or anything of those sorts, right? So if there were to be something that, you know, prevented you from going Quine's way, it wouldn't be surprising to be the that it would be the very thing that Quine wants to reject so strongly. Uh, so he says it's, it's, a, it's of the nature of a red rose that it's red, let us suppose, and suppose that I have a red rose. If I say this rose is red, for that sentence to become false, there must be a change, right? And it can't be 
one of these Cambridge changes. It sounds like it has to be, it sounds as if the relationship between the sentences of the rows is of the right sort, but then, so, so it seems like this is fine, but Armstrong is going to, and this is the next section, I guess, he's going to bring in the, the essentialism and the thesis as being important to the truth maker thesis. Right. So, I mean, to get his problem with, Armstrong's problem with Quine. So I don't have a rose, but I have two Sharpies. Well, let's pretend it's right. one Sharpie. So the, the, the Sharpie is red. <laughs> you know, I, I need that in my care example. Um, so you think it's, if you're a nominalist or Quine, you just, you just say this, this, this object makes it true that the Sharpie is red. But then in another possible world, since the color of the Sharpie is a contingent matter, what, here's the Sharpie. But it's not making true that the Sharpie is red. Um, but it, so it seems like the Sharpie is equally in both worlds, but in one world it's making the, the, the claim that the Sharpie is red true and one it isn't. So that seems to be a problem. It seems that the Sharpie alone can't be what makes the Sharpie is red true. Right. Um, so, um, but, I guess Armstrong saying, or I mean Parsons is saying that Quine is not saying when you say the Sharpie is red, you're not making any kind of commitment, right? Maybe what you're saying in order for this possible world to become this one, right? You'd have to make a non-Cambridge change to this. And that's enough for this to be the truth maker for the Sharpie is red. Um, right, to get this world to be this world where the Sharpie is not red. Like even, even, even assuming that this, sorry, that this could be the same Sharpie as this just in a different possible world. How do you keep doing that? That's amazing. <laughs> I have a full possible world path. That's, uh, wow. <laughs> She's got the two counterparts. <laughs> Oh, that, that reminds me, I was uh, with my book club with my, uh, I went to a women's college Smith and we were have a book club and one of the older alumni was uh, talking about when she was uh, at Smith, you were only allowed to leave campus with your parents' permission. But if you were lucky, you could get this blanket permission and a blanket permission was kind of ironically named, I guess, meant that you could leave whenever you want. <laughs> and it would be for the whole semester, they would write you a blanket permission, you know, so. Um, Yes, I have, wow. a possible world, I have full possible world blanket permission. So I can, <laughs> I can just pop over and visit my Sharpie and black Sharpie world like that. It's just, thank goodness. So, so, he, so Parsons, Parsons says that Armstrong's argument against Quine isn't uh, exactly an offensive one as much as it's one that is, uh, that he says, on balance makes nominalism rather less plausible than it would otherwise be. So, I mean, Armstrong is just, I guess, pointing out that if you hold as he does that the truth-making relation is an internal relation and you would think that it, for him, that an internal relation is one where the existence of, the mere existence of the terms in any possible world entails the existence of that relation, uh, then, you know, I mean, you you have to have these other you have to have these worlds, which are things that, of course, Quine is gonna accept. So, uh, right, yeah, right, because it's not the and, and that and that generally Sharpie. a very strong novelist might not accept. Although, I mean, it varies, but you know. right. If you think that truth makers need to be tied to their truth essentially, so that in any possible world where you put the truth maker, you get the you get the truth, then you have a problem with this world, right? Because it was the truth, this, this very pen was supposed to be the truth maker for the pen, the Sharpie is red. Right. This very pen happens to be in a world where it's black, right? Um, so 
it's not it's not the case that the truth maker essentially makes this pen is red true right um so um if you if you do think that the truth maker is you know you've got to get you've somehow got to get this in all possible worlds right so right can I, can I, if the redness of the sharpie is a contingent matter right there's some background here that i'm either forgetting or i, I just never knew it seems to me for Armstrong, what's what's necessary, what's important, is the uh, intrinsicality of the truth maker, um, and um, there's there's some history here where in, it's assumed that intrinsic intrinsicality entails essentiality because of modality. There's something about that, and I'm not I'm not familiar with that background, but that seems to be not so much what Armstrong is assuming, but um, presupposing or it's just an explicit premise. <laughs> um, but, but what is the background there that says that if one accepts intrinsic properties, one must accept Leibniz's law? What is, is that? Is it, it's just, an, uh, what is it? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm missing it. Yeah. Leibniz. Just Leibniz? But, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what, I think what drives Armstrong to something that's akin to essentialism is his wanting to capture entailment without entailment, right? Like um, this in virtue of relationship, basically, right? That it's in virtue of this, that the sentence the Sharpie is read as true. Um, and so, but you don't have logical entailment because this is not a proposition on Armstrong's view, right? Um, it's it's a state of affairs or you know a object with some properties or whatever. So you've got to. So what does it mean to say that this makes something true? Well, one way to say is it it you know anytime you get this, you get the truth, and that kind of sounds like no matter what world you throw it in, you get a red pen. But we know that the redness of the pen is a contingent matter. So when you throw this into a world, if you're just throwing it qua pen and not something more complicated, you get this world and then all bets are off, right? Because this is not, you know, the in virtue of, right? So the, the pen is red. You've lost that connection, right? So the essential, I think this, this sort of, the notion of an essential connection between truth makers and the things that make them true is another way of trying to not use the phrase um, entailment, right? because you know, I mean, because that's one way to say you know you get you, you this means this, right? Is that the truth that the two propositions, right? That one is true, therefore the other one is true. But but if anything, I would not have been to make this distinction. He, he would not want that's uh, intrinsic. Um, properties to be essential, right? I mean, that would be it would be in his favor, it would seem, if that's his only motivation. So it can't be. He he wants states of affairs to be essential, so he's not trying to get away from this uh, necessitation. It's just that it can't be because they're not propositions. So that I mean, I think that's a different motivation, right? Well, well, I'm trying to think that the his way of his way of accounting for the necessitation might be that there's something essential about. The connection between the truth and the, the there's something essential about this state of affairs right because he wants something like makes, necessitation so he needs the essential nature in order to get something like necessitation like, even necessitation, not, like right. entailment i see it so he does he want it this way. yes that's right, right because he can't use just simply use entailment because this is supposed to be a physical thing in the world and not a proposition that can entail anything right but but if, if this essentially meaning whenever you get this you get a red pen <laughs> right or you get the truth of the proposition this pen is red um that might that might explain the in virtue of this the intimacy of the connection the we can't say entailment but we mean entailment right entailment star or um, whatever yeah. Huh. 
Yeah, there's something tricky going on here, right? Because it's like, mm -hmm. because, because Armstrong's understanding of modality ultimately comes down to his understanding of like states of affairs, right? Yeah. It seems like, but these claims um, are about uh, the existence um, of particulars uh, in various worlds. And so it's not, yeah, the, the fact that these things aren't, you know, lining up is part of, I think, what produces this. Exactly. This weird effect, logically. Right, because I think, I think Armstrong very much thinks that there are a truth like, or, or to say something like this pen could have been black is made true by this pen and the fact that it's colors contingent fact about it, not made true by this possible world being real, right? And he's not a possible world realist. So. Yeah, yeah it's, uh... but, okay, so it, it... <laughs> All of this is motivating Armstrong towards the states of affair metaphysics that he has. If Parsons gives up on this essentiality of, of intrinsicality, is a nominalist, so he's not. <laughs> 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 um, and and it, it, so he's giving up states of affairs, any sort of, well, anything but concrete particulars. He's going to run into all the logical issues that all the other papers we've read brought up, right? There can't be this no, truth-making no, relationship. No, not, not, not him. He makes it clear. He's going to let somebody else worry about that. Well, no, he's going to let someone else worry <laughs> about it. It's a real problem. <laughs> so, but, but that's the background that's motivating Armstrong to solve these problems and introduce this whole, you know, metaphysics. So I'm. It, it's inter it's an interesting point he's making, but it seems like another mark towards you know truth-making can't work, <laughs> camp, right? unless he goes on to solve all the other problems, which he's saying that's someone else's issue, but everyone else is saying, oh, that's a big issue. <laughs> let's, do, let's introduce essentiality <laughs> or something. So there, there's something horrible about this, if he's right, right? For truth-making theory. Right. I mean. Or put another way, can a nominalist have a truth-making theory? He says, maybe that's for someone else to work out but this isn't an issue but right with the whole background that we've read about all the issues logical issues with truth making this seems to be a kind of a nail in the coffin for a nominalist even though he's kind of saying this specific attack isn't isn't the end of me <laughs> but and and this he's saying th this in virtue of relationship that armstrong is trying to get with capture with something like essentialism about this essentially makes the pen is read true. So this might be, must be a state of affairs and not just a pen, right? Because it's contingently read. Right. Um, and he's saying, well, no, you just need the pen right. to get the truth-making relationship. But the entailment is something like, um, if the pen in its intrinsic nature as it is, makes the sentence true. And in order to make the sentence false, you'd have to make a non-Cambridge change to the pen. Then that's what gets you the uh, in virtue of relationship between this just mere object now. Right. And the pen is read, right? Because if you consider the intrinsic properties of this mere object, meaning the properties that it has, you know, not in terms of its, you know, the fact that it's now you know, if someone sneezed, <laughs> it's now like 30 miles from someone who just sneezed or something, right? Like, but the, if the intrinsic properties of it um, make it true, and in order to change the truth to a falsity, you'd have to make a non-Cambridge -cha non change to it, then that's enough to capture the in virtue of that we're looking for, something like that. Right, rather than saying, anytime you throw this truth maker into a universe, you get this pen is red you say look you know um well but this there's doesn't something make this pen is red right true but you've made a non-cambridge change to the pen to get to this world 
So this is complicated though, right? Because I think maybe, maybe does this argument to some extent not entirely uh, go against Armstrong because uh, for Armstrong, the relevant relata of the truth-making relation, one of them has to be a state of affairs, right? Right. Not, it's, not, it's not just the rose, right? It's, no. Well, that's, yeah. that's the point. It's the rose that being red. Something to the rose. It's the rose plus an extra something which turns out to be the state of affairs. Right. Yeah. Which seems to make sense, right? Because, you know, if we talk about the bear being on the mat, it's not just the bear or the mat that makes it true, it's the state of affairs. So it seems to be saying, well, if, if it's a contingent matter that pens are red, then it's not just the pen that makes it true that the pen is red, it's the fact that this is a red one. <laughs> the state of affairs of this well, pen. The state of affairs of that pen being red. Pen being red, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of that pen being red. Yeah, something like that. So the pen the pen's definitely helping, just like the bear and the mat are definitely part of it. But there's also the state of affairs of the bear being on the mat. But that's an abstract entity above and beyond just the pen. So that's going to violate what Quine says. So you have to be against Quine, or so Armstrong argues. And Parsons wants right. nothing to do with non uh, reducible relational facts. Right. So, but okay. Yeah, so for him, it, I mean, this is a non-Cambridge change, I guess, to the bear and the max, I had to pull them apart. Um, I mean, that's not an, that's an extrinsic, I don't know, that's not intrinsic, but we're, I mean, we're talking about examples, I guess, where it's like, you know, just a single object making something true rather than two. So yeah, so this, this pen makes it true that the, that there was a red pen. It also makes it true that there's a Sharpie it also makes it true that there's a object being used as an example on a Zoom call. It does a lot of stuff, but it's just the one pen, right? Not various different states of affairs, like the state of affair of it being red, the state of affairs of it being a particular brand, the state of affairs of me doing something on a Zoom call, right? It's just this pen is making all those things true. Um, but how did and, Parsons... So like the Australia example, what, what, what's the bear's name? Boris, is that right? Is it Boris? Boris, yeah. Yeah, so how did Parsons get around this? So with Australia, the location of, of Canberra and, and, and Sydney were intrinsic to Australia, but what is the, right. the thing for Parsons that is Boris on the mat? It's not the state of affairs, is it? And it's not a myriological sum, he said, or fusion, right? It's something else, it's just the whole. How did he, I forget from the last paper. Yeah, that's a good question. But whatever it is, it's it's, that positioning is intrinsic to that entity, which is the concrete particular that is the truth. The bear mat? Yeah, the, the, the bear mat is the object or something. But so it's non relational, but it's something like a myriological fusion of the two things. Right. It's a, yeah, it's a whole. It's the whole. A yeah. temporarily existing whole, maybe. Right. So the whole of the bear mat makes. The sentence the bear is on the mat true along with the mat and the bear obviously i guess right and so boris or no and the no mat maybe just the whole does i don't know but 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 boris and the mat are both proper parts of the whole as truth maker as concrete entity that intrinsically make true but not essentially make true the proposition that boris is on the mat right but is that is that departure from nominalism to say that the bear mat is a is <laughs> that's a Exactly, <laughs> exactly it's what I'm getting whole, at. Yeah. Right, that is not. That's right, I just don't know what more Armstrong has in mind with states of affairs. It can't well, just Well, I mean, no, he, I think he has in mind that uh, the same, you know, Boris Kuhn Matt <laughs> if, mm -hmm. uh, will make that sentence true uh, in any world in which it exists, you know. Right. I mean, I think his point is the world can be different in other ways, but as long as you've got Boris on the mat, which is that state of affairs in some world, it's going to make the statement true. Right. It's I, I think, I think the, it sounds like the, you know, the intuition is that as long as there's some amount of invariance when we, you know, conceptualize these possibilities that ought to be sufficient for the, you know, for the truth of 
the the usual statement. Um, so both Parsons and Armstrong will call this a, a different kind of thing than Boris and the Matt. For Ar for for Parsons, it'll be some sort of mere logical whole, and for Armstrong, it'll be state of affairs. Right. I don't know that they're that different. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. They both at. have a kind of right. They kind of have a rich ontology that goes beyond. Right. I mean, unless Armstrong Obvious. explicitly says that the state of affairs is something above and beyond Boris and the Matt. It's Boris and the Matt and the state of affairs. That's what Parsons would reject. I, I just don't know Armstrong's metaphysics closely enough. Well, I guess the question right. is whether, I mean, it's complicated. I guess the question is, does it have to be, I mean, does he think that it has to be abstract or can it be concrete or what, right? I don't. Right. I guess for Parsons, are, it's, it's a... not going to inhere in the relata. So it's going to give you external right. relations. I'm sorry, external for relations. For Parsons, it's concrete, right? I guess, like Australia's concrete. The... Yeah. But for Armstrong, it might be abs abstract. I don't know. It must be. I don't, I don't mm. actually know how he thinks of the states of affairs. I'm not entirely sure that he does. I, yeah, it's hard. I, I, I mean, why I, would he attack Quine's position if he didn't take states of affairs to be abstract? He's, he's very clear in his opinionated book, of which I read the first uh, 20, 30 pages, uh, that he thinks uh, Quine's nominalism is excessive and that uh, well, and, and that you can be excessive on the other side too, and that he's try, trying to chart a middle course. Hmm. Well, we can find out more when I start my Clubhouse channel, uh, reading Armstrong exclusively. <laughs> Are you gonna do that? <laughs> <laughs> I might, I might. I Let's know. do it. Uh... <laughs> right, I mean, on. 327, Armstrong just suggests he wants to take predicates seriously. So, yeah, I guess those are, does that mean that he, to take what them seriously mean? is to treat them as some sort of abstraction or? Right, what does that mean to it, take could them it, seriously? Could you just, I mean, I, I suppose you could take them seriously by the is, he, is right? he a realist about, prop, about, yeah, about properties of some kind, maybe, I don't know. So. Yeah, if you were a trope theorist, you could say, look, there's um, what's made true, what makes this true is that, um, well, I guess it depends on if you want to treat the pen, the pen is just a bundle of tropes. <laughs> but let's say, let's you say there's the, there's the pen, whatever it is, and the trope that it's read. Um, and they're both concrete, but it's more than just the pen and it's more than the nominalist would allow. There's the trope that's the redness of the pen, right? Yeah. Kind of a cherry, cherry right. or fire and gloom ready. Um, but if the nominalists won't allow that, then that's going to be a problem. But the, but you could you could that kind of trope theorist and have it. Well, it's abstract in the sense of abstract particular, right? Because we're focusing just on this bit. <laughs> right. But, it's still abstract though. So. But it's still a it's still a. Well, so. So Parsons argues that if he can defend thoroughgoing nominalism, then weak nominalism that wants tropes is going to work. But I wasn't quite sure the reverse, where if you accept, you know, a Quinean, um, you know, sort of poor or, um, you know, uh, weakened, I don't know what do you call it, um, sparse, um, sparse ontology, that that's even the issue. It seems like even with Parsons' solution, you still have this question of essentiality, right? So even if you take Boris and the Matt to be a myriological sum, you, you could still say what Armstrong wants to say, which is that that, you know, the, Bor the object of Boris on the Matt has that, has Boris and, and the Matt essentially, and that's gonna play into this, the logical relation with the propositions that it makes true. It seems like you still have that issue. So I feel like that's in the background and Parsons not tackling it as you know, right. the motivation for the essentiality. He's just saying, look, what Quine says, it's not going to put you at odds with, with truth making, but I don't know if that's right. I mean, it just seems out of context and too scope. Oh, that's why I think Parson has all that stuff about how it is Australia that makes Canberra south of Sydney. I'm trying to get this right this time. 
Um, but it's not the case. I actually pulled up a Google Maps last time and had it in front of me just so I would stop making the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's fooled me by, yeah, you just think of Sydney as a New South Wales. You think of down there. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so S Sydney, okay, so uh, Canberra is south of Sydney and it's Australia that makes it so, but Sydney and Canberra's positions in Australia are not essential properties of Australia, right? So there are possible worlds where Sydney is due west of Canberra. So maybe it's something like that. There may be, maybe it's <laughs> Boris Matman or whatever, <laughs> Boris, Boris Matthole. <laughs> that sounds really bad. <laughs> Boris, uh, the, the meteorological hole of Boris being on the mat does not essentially have to do Boris or Matt in it. <laughs> Um, but it is the case that it, it's what makes Boris beyond the mat. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I mean, it. yeah. I mean, there's there were some details in the Parsons paper from last week that we weren't really sure mm. that he that he that he then says it all gets comes down to hacidities or whatever and anxiety. Hexaides, yeah. Hexaides. Yeah, we talked yeah. about that a lot. And actually, yeah. I've been thinking about that this past hour, mm. not wanting to distract because I don't think Parsons cares and I don't think Armstrong cares either. But I think this is how I would get around all of this in that um, while it's true that the rose, the red rose might have been yellow, the proposition that's being made true, to, true is that this rose is, is red. And um, ah, no, that doesn't work. I, I'm not sure I understand what the problem is, uh, or even if I care about essentialism anymore. I'd have to review <laughs> why the truth maker relation needs to be necessary and how that relates to the modal truths and the counterparts um, of uh, objects with contingent properties enters into it. I just don't. I, this is one of, I, I don't intuitively this is, see a problem. I just see people trying to avoid universals. That's all I see. I, mean, I, yeah. I have to go into the details to get further. I don't know. There are so many details. This is like the first philosophical topic I've engaged with where I think there's a legitimate reason for a flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There are a tremendous amount of moving pieces. So it's many really moving pieces. And you, you'll, you'll hone difficult. in on one thing. You think, oh, that's obvious. Let's put that over there. But then you break three things over here, you know? And you need yeah, to know yeah, everything sort of together. We read these papers it's and the author is like convinced that this is the solution. And then we read something else where that author points out something so obvious about this other problem. And it. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I definitely, I, I, that, that's definitely, definitely the feeling I'm having. But but I'm quite sure that the truth maker problem, intrinsicality, and modality all have to solve, be solved together. And maybe hexiety too. You have to do all four together or it just slips away. Yeah. 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 Do you think the hexiety is a, a separate issue from modality? Because you, you have to determine well, what it is to be a counterpart and, and that's going to bring in hex AD or some sort of identity, right? Yeah. The reason I bring it in is because it's, uh, well, because it came up last week uh, and also because it's something about which I disagree with uh, Lewis, or at least I think I do, in that I take the counterparts not to be given by the similarity relation, uh, but rather that there is a distinct possible, well, you see, for Lewis, uh, a possible world is determined by its qualities, right? So if you have two different possible worlds that are qualitatively identical, but in one of them, um, I'm the one that looks like me and in the other one, I'm the one that looks like my brother, uh, then I would consider those distinct possible worlds. I would consider the second one to be one in which I swapped places with my brother. What does that mean? It means that uh, I have his properties that is, I have oh. his present world properties at that world. Oh, so you think, right. So you think Lewis doesn't say it enough with, with similarity. You need something like X A D to allow for well, cases. You no, look no, like- no, 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 he doesn't need anything. He, he would just say that it's meaningless to swap all your properties with something because your identity just is all of your properties. 
But I th yeah, I thought the Freaky Friday experiments were supposed to be like nonsense. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, it's not I think they, they are for him, but but I'd, right. I'd, I'd rather say that they do make sense and that they only don't make sense if you forget the availability of hexaity. Now, why do I care about hexaity? Mm -hmm. um, mainly because I think that somehow the semantics of indexicals together with modality and the truth maker relation will come together to solve some of these problems. Have I done the work? No. But doesn't that kind of smell <laughs> like a Cartesian dualism? Like how would you make yeah. sense of that like an apple and an orange? Like this apple is another mm -hmm. possible world, that orange. Like what does that even mean? Like with the mental, it kind of makes sense, but I'm wondering if it makes sense because we're smuggling in like a dualism with like plain non Let's just consider apples and oranges. I, I don't think it fails to make sense. I don't see what the problem is exactly. Okay, well, I, I don't understand it then, I guess. So with the apple and orange, if you have an apple and orange and I say there's a possible world in which this apple is actually this orange, what does that mean? I, I don't even know what that means. Oh, uh, um, well, you could, I mean, you, you're looking at something, right? Well, look, I mean, well, you can rigidly designate worlds. it and change it slowly. No, no, this like, I don't, this I don't know if have, I don't know if it has to do with x or not as much as two, it has to do. Yeah. There's two different issues here. Uh, one is, uh, suppose I have an apple at this world, at my, at, at the actual world, and then there's a possible world at which I have not an apple, but an orange. I could say that that is the apple that is. The orange at that possible world is the apple at this world. And then what, what rigidly designates the apple as the orange or vice versa? Um, not its nature. Well, clearly, well, <laughs> I mean, uh, what I mean, that's, I suppose that question that, that you just said, Josh, making sense of it is the first thing to do because, uh, I mean, Rigid, de rigid designators are just names. There isn't something which under ride, you know, un undergirds them in some property-driven sense, at least not for, for Kripke, or maybe there is, I'm not sure, but not, there's nothing that I can recall in naming necessity anyways, which requires it. Um, this, this to me seems more a question of just whether or not if you know, any given particular could, could have had very radically different properties or not, which is not necessarily the same issue as sexuality. Well, if there's like a baptismal or christening event, it just comes down to Rodrigo's mom calling his brother Rodrigo, and then that's enough to make modal claims true, right? But how does that, how does that issue? What do, you, what do you mean? No, 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 that's not. Or if I, this apple was an orange because instead of grabbing the apple, I grabbed the orange. That's the sort of christening event, I, I guess. No, no, that's not what I mean, no. Because the point is the apple is named Bob, right? And okay, the question so is I, just, could, you know, the question is just, could Bob have been green? You know, could Bob have been, uh, you know, more uh, uh, rotten, right? Uh, the uh, you know, could and then of course the hard question, Bob's? could Bob Let's have leave been the naming orange? of inanimate objects to Karen, all right? That's, that's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 but Josh, the point is that the name is the rigid designator. It's yeah, not about exactly. the baptism or anything like that. That's just how the initial reference is fixed. Okay, right. but right. right, but we we need but the, that, it it came up because we wanted we need to be able to ask the question. So I'm just yeah. saying like rigidly designate your apple and then and then ask the question. Well, could it have been orange in color? Well, yeah, could uh, it right. Have, but the point is, you know, the point is, could it have tasted but, more citrusy? Yeah. Well, could it have been an orange? Yeah. The point is that Bob the the, the, uh, the rigid designator could just be by way of a name that is introduced on the fly, stipulatively. You know, it could just mm -hmm. be the fruit in hand. You know, I take that to rigid, but let's designate whatever fruit it is that I have in hand yeah. at any possible world. And and um, what they would have in common is not obviously any of the qualitative properties. Uh, you could, of course, say that it has the property of being the fruit I have in hand, but um, but but you can just hang, hang it on hexady and say, no, no, it's just this thing. And that's it, and leave it at that. But it's, I don't understand that. That's what I'm getting at. So if it's not similarity, if it's not uh, rigid yeah. designation, what is, what is hex AD? No, 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 it is, it is rigid designation. It's just not rigid designation by way of any particular kind of event or property. Just because the demonstrative this apple, yes. is that what you mean? That's right. Mm -hmm.
yeah, not to be confused with an act of demonstration, like an extension or a pointing or anything like that. Just, you know, some abs some metaphysically peculiar property that people like to argue about um, called anxiety. Um, <laughs> thisness, to use English. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that's not something Lewis goes along with. And it's something that I tolerate because I find similarity relation complications about counterparts and, and proximity of worlds to not be worth the trouble. And I'd rather just multiply worlds since we already have too many of them. Yeah, but I, I'm still, this still bugs me. So <laughs> let's say you have two christening events where you say this apple or this orange, or of course you don't say orange or apple, you just say this could have been, and then you say something about it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you determine that those events are counterparts? And then if it's anything to do with similarity, I just wonder if you've really leaned on hex 80 or if you're still depending on similarity conditions to determine counterparts in some sense. I'm not sure I understand the question. So if there are two events where you say this could have been more like an orange or more like an apple um, and it's a rigid designation by, by you know, thisness as you've outlined it, how do you determine that those two events are counterpart events so that the thing you're referring to is the, th the same thing? And it seems to establish the relation between those events as being counterparts, you're going to, re you're going to bring in similarity. Well, it might, it, our ability to determine doesn't, yeah, our, 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 our ability to determine uh, doesn't necessarily settle it, right? Like if you, you could think of, um, there's plenty of possible worlds where should I be able to get them with my blanket pass, you know, my blanket blanket permission to, get, to go to possible world, I would not be able to find the Josh because in that world, you know, you're a seven and a half foot Chinese woman. <laughs> I couldn't Knew find it. you for all the looking. You know? <laughs> so, like, I've always that inside, I feel more like a seven and a half foot Chinese woman. A basketball star of world famous renown. No, I, yeah, it, I don't know. Um, well, my point is so for, for, for Lewis, there's something about determining closeness of, of, of worlds with, with similarity. Right. And so it seems like even Hex 80 talk is going to bottom out in similarity talk and establishing closeness of worlds. Uh, unless... No, no, he would just deny Hex 80, I think. I, I don't know what he actually says about it. He, he certainly does have something to say. But, but, um, but my, my yeah, I imagine he says that I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, my point in introducing any of this is just to say that I don't want to deal with the similarity issue, um, except as pragmatics, maybe, um, in, in making decisions about how to interpret counterfactuals. But, um, but from a purely semantic point of view, uh, and a metaphysical point of view, I, I, I would rather uh, swallow the consequences of accepting uh, hexaity. Now, having done that, uh, the um, uh, I, I'm not sure how that applies to. Oh, and maybe maybe the way that applies to the issue in this paper is that hex eighty would be the only essential property of a thing, uh, at least in absolute terms. Obviously, in relative terms, we consider many more properties essentially, such as when we say physically necessary and so on. What came up in the last paper and then in this paper, I suppose, kind of implicitly in the thin versus thick. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I think that would be with me. Um, I have heard lengthy like, arguments that at the apple that Adam and the Eve ate was a pair. I don't know that's right, but anyway. Yeah, because there weren't apples like that back then. It was the yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we understand those claims. You know, the apple was a pear. <laughs> yeah. In this world, you don't even need a possible one. Well, I guess it depends on what you think about the truth of the book of Genesis. Right? Maybe you do need a possible world. Sometimes a crab apple is just going to have to be enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I learned this like last year that Johnny Appleseed just was basically planting crab apples, which are like inedible. Really? <laughs> What's the point? Yeah. yeah. I, 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 right. I heard. I guess they, I heard unless they really was, did eat them. Oh, Karen heard something. Heard, She's good at these things. Well, I heard it was it was mostly about making cider. That's right. It was yeah. That's right. Like alcoholic cider. Right. So they're not good for eating, yeah. but they're good for cider, and and that's they're good for making booze. For booze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God bless America. 
that was a that was a big industry, hence the whiskey rebellion. Uh, well, because it was like before beer, right? Not before beer, but it was something. Well, it was a good way of getting liquid you could drink safely, I guess. Right. That's the charitable interpretation, right? But it was also a good. Um, uh, there weren't that many, I think on the frontier, there weren't that many cash crops, but booze was one of them. Like if you could make something in the booze, you could make a little money. So it's not stupid, I guess. Yeah. Aaron, I feel like we both listen to the same podcast, but you just remember. All <laughs> <laughs> no, I grew I grew, up, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and lived in, in Kentucky. So yeah, we're, pr- uh, okay. we're, we're proud of our work with stills, stills up in the mountains. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, well, so what, I don't have any takeaways because I'm just waiting to see where the ax is going to drop when I read the last two papers by Lewis. Uh, but I want to know whether this is at all hmm. constructive for any of you and your efforts to avoid coming to the dark side with me. <laughs> Is the dark side possible worlds or what? Where is it? Modal realism? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, modal realism. Yeah. Yeah. Modal realism. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just, just in talking the paper over with you, I, I have, I am coming more and more to think that maybe the issue here is caused by Armstrong not wanting to be a modal realist, right? Wanting to think that. Yes. The truth of. The truth maker for modal <clears throat> for the modal claim that this pen could have been black is something about this pen. You don't have to go to any other possible world, right? Uh, the nature of you know pens, how they're manufactured, the choices that people make when making pens, those sorts of things make it a contingent fact that this pen is a, r- a red pen. Nonetheless, whenever you get this state of affairs, <laughs> the pen is red is true. Um, so yeah, so it does seem a weird thing to say if you're, especially if you're going to say that that's an essential matter, right? That it's whenever you get this state of affairs, essentially, the pen is red is true, when uh, you also recognize that this is a contingent matter. That does seem a little bit weird, but maybe it's because Armstrong is uh, is he wants to have a uh, uh, yeah he doesn't want to be as 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 parsimonious as the nominalist. So he doesn't want all these possible worlds and he doesn't want to, but he also doesn't want all these possible worlds. Right. So he'll, he'll take, he'll take um, objects and states of affairs or objects and predicates, uh, but, uh, but not possible worlds. So just... By the way, uh, that sounds about right. Think... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, one reason I think modality is so important here is not just because there are truths with modal contexts, that is modal truths that have to be accounted for. That's bad enough, of course. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I think even just accounting for um, predication and negation already implicates modality. Yeah, Yeah, agreed, 100% agree. Certainly Brandon thinks so. (laughs) Oh, I'm not getting it from him. I I, I, I know, mm -hmm. I know, I'm I'm just poking at you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got to figure out how to deal with that guy. Um, it's just, I don't, I don't know what to do. The whole business about thermostats, obviously, I can't, I can't go there again. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. About what? Never responded. When, when did we talk about this? Was it last week? Like Saturday. Was it? Oh yeah, no. Okay, right. So that's why I was confused. But it, it is in the recording. Um, yeah. So like basically, the last recording was way too long. Uh, oh no. We would have finished the paper an hour and a half, but then Josh hadn't spoken for like three minutes. So I said, Josh, <laughs> you have a face, and then he launched into this thing, right? <laughs> and, oh, and, yeah. Don't ask that, me questions unless you want me to launch. <laughs> and then, and then that, that provoked an answer in me, which wasn't. It wasn't much, it was just a response, but then it provoked me to think, but I gotta deal with content somehow. And then I was thinking about Brandom, and then I thought, after reading Brandom, I was again inspired, not inspired, moved, no, uh, provoked. I was provoked to think that, um, you know, after all considerations of how to get 
normativity in there, but not too far, you know, just to get it just right, then maybe thermostats have thoughts after all. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I know. And oh, uh, Josh had the yeah. perfect response, which was, okay, damn it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, the, the, th the thing is, though, it's not a crazy, it's not a crazy idea because I wasn't simply dismissing the relevance of normativity. Uh, I was just trying to locate it in a new place for what I think are de decent reasons. But on review, I realized I'm basically just confused, and it's Brendan's fault. So at the very least, I can give him <laughs> yeah. that. He's, to be fair, throughout the whole discussion, to... yeah. I mean, to be, to be throughout the whole discussion, it wasn't my thermostat, but my clock was thinking this is going on way too long. <laughs> so, <laughs> it wasn't crazy. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's good to be confused. You know, it just means that you understand the problem and and at least you know what resources you have to drop on. So, I, so I, I take the truth maker thing seriously. I think the essentialism I took for granted. Now I feel like I can't take it for granted. I'm hoping the modal realism addresses issues, although I know that there are issues with that. And then the content and normativity is not really related to this, but maybe it is. Um, yeah, it's good to be confused. It means you have something to figure out. Not that everyone has it, what, things to be confused about. But. Was it was it that uh, Heaven Can Wait movie that made you rethink <laughs> your, uh, Sorry, the, the idea be, that... Back. The hexaities of the self <laughs> in a world where you, no, you had all your brother's no, I, properties. No, no okay. I told you why. There are two reasons I like hexaity. One, um, uh, because I don't like the similarity relation for counterparts. And two, because, um, because I think they say something important about the semantics of indexes. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway. I've got nothing else for this paper. I, 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 I you know, I, Parsons has my respect. I think he's somebody to follow. And uh, <laughs> did anybody think about um, swamp men, uh, swamp people content? Because if uh, intrinsicality makes true propositions, and whatever's true of you know Donald Davidson will be true of his his swamp Davidson, right? Because the intrinsic properties make make true. So I wasn't sure what this oh. you have for content externalism. I did think about it, but I didn't think it would be that much of a problem since um, I'm happy to consider content relational and extrinsic. So the truth maker would just be the lineage or the history. But no, he argued, so Parsons in the last paper argues that all truth makers would, uh, it would be an internal property that makes makes true. So there would have to well, be something. My, my, my point is the content would be internal, just not internal to the swamp man. It would be internal to the it, swamp man's history. Well, it would have to be something larger than Swamp Man and the history. It would have to be something encompassing them both, right? Like, yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. 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 Interesting. I mean, that's just something I never considered before. That for a content externalist account plus truth making, you need something like a myriological fusion of the entire world that includes the whole history and that entity, and it's that as truth maker that would make any statements about content true. Um, yeah. You I know, know, I've always. That. I've always thought this, and I've always oh. recognized as well that it is the primary objection to selectionist accounts, namely that, let me put it in this language actually, namely that the scientific worldview uh, is deeply committed to the intrinsicality of the properties that they are studying. Because you want reproducible results. And you want it to be about loss. Yeah. Well, yeah. If, if you want it to be about laws and the intrinsic natures of the things you're studying, then really what would make true your claims would be like the world and the thing you're studying, right? Or the laws and the well, thing I think I think you'd have to give up on content externalism, or if you insist on it, it could be something social. but not historical. Right, but I guess this is what's weird on like a Parsons account of, of rejecting reducibly relational facts is that what would make clear your statements about entities would be a different object altogether, not that entity, but whatever encompasses that entity 
and the environment that makes true the statements about the entity, right? Yes. That's, that's kind of weird. So it's not, it's not as simple as just saying the history of the thing, but it's really the thing which is the history plus the entity that makes true the statements about the entity. Well, by history, I didn't mean like what we would write, like the prepositions that are true about its past. I meant all the past events themselves. Sure, but it's not just all the past events themselves. Whether it's no. a set or a conjunction or a sum or fusion, it would have to be all of that plus the entity. And then whatever that larger thing is, which is the whole. You mean the Australia? The Australia of that type mm -hmm. of scenario. Yeah, but that's kind of what I meant about the history. It's like, it's, it's all of those events, but in, 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 a, in a fusion. Uh, the time warp. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so the time so, warp makes yeah. all things, yeah. The okay. worm, okay, this right. is deep philosophy, Josh. The worm makes the swamp have thoughts. Exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but, but I pre presumably if you're, a, if you're a good nominalist, you're not gonna really be happy with time worms. You're just gonna be, it's just gonna be all the objects along the way in that history, right? So if, if, if it's, if, is it every person that I've ever met that is basically part of the story of the content of my mind or every object oh. that I've ever encountered? Right, because yeah, it, more, yeah what, I mean, what's, a, what's a time worm when it's at its grand, right? Like that, that doesn't seem like something a nominalist would be that happy with. So for the history, those things right? All, why, why not? I mean, the nominalists, history, nominalists no, don't, don't deny the past history, events. That sounds a bit like a state of affairs or a series of events rather than, you know, um, if you're, if you want things to make things true, then wouldn't it just be all those things that were part of the history? Hmm. Right. Isn't that the same thing? Isn't that what I said? I mean, first of all, this is just this is just about fixing content. Uh, to get ordinary predication, you're going to need more than things anyway. You're going to need the properties. Right. So this isn't about being a good nominalist. It's just about being a good externalist. Well, no, it's it's even more for the good uh, good nominalist. A lot more. Well, if you want to be both, yeah, but. I'm not trying. Because right, universals, he's going to have to fix with like particulars or something. And there, there's going to have to be more universals than... with states of affairs, whatever they are. Yeah. But you're the one who's interested. Well, Armstrong in does, I but not like Parson. Him. Yeah, not Parson. He's uh, a hard well, I don't know what Parson wants. He's just picking at him. He's just, he's just finding problems. But this is my point. Like saying something like, look, you could be a nominalist and still be, you know, truth making theorists. It's like, yeah, but then what about content? What about my, what about modality? What about all these other things? Like it's just, it's just too easy to like argue about one point. It's, it's making, not so that's, that's, that's why it's only 10 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be, to be fair to Parsons, uh, maybe it's part of a larger project. And if you knew his larger project, you know, maybe. On the other yeah. hand, it is not atypical uh, to, to make a career just by poking holes at other people's ideas. So it's- Yeah, it's true. You shouldn't take it too seriously. Uh, on the other hand, um, I mean, what it does is it, it makes room for somebody else. And there are people who want that room. So it's not pointless, right? There's Peter Simons, he's doing something, right? And also um, it's worth separating the projects, you know, the, the projects- Yeah, I know, I mean- Realism I... and the projects regarding truth makers. Sure, for sure, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's true, yeah. I mean, especially since Armstrong makes such a big deal about how he's doing one for the other. So what are we reading next? Um, <laughs> the the uh, Rodriguez Pereira. I don't know oh, whether to okay. pronounce it in English and Spanish. I usually don't like to pronounce words in their original language, but those particular words are so awkward in English. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Why don't you say? Why don't you say it? See if I can hear it. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's at the bottom of the anthology. Why truth makers? Gonzalo Rodriguez Pereira. Wait, Pereira. Yeah. <laughs> you see? It's the second one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's easy. It's Pereira. Yeah. It's no big deal. Uh, but anyway, Josh and I had a whole discussion about yeah. what to do about pronunciation when learning a language. Oh it's, my God. It's torture. it's torture for me right now with the French. Yeah. It's like I'm getting really good at you the know. grammar, but I haven't gotten past square one on pronunciation. Oh, no. <laughs> 
I I listened to a uh, a podcast by this, this gentleman who I won't mention, <laughs> Rodrigo Pereira. I, yeah, I, um, and uh, it was completely unintelligible because he referred again and again to a handout that wasn't available on my phone. So I'm going to scour the internet oh, no. <laughs> see if I can find the handout because if I can find the handout, it might be helpful. <laughs> um, he makes a difference between oh. Uh, um, conjunctions and groupings or something? I don't know. It was, it was interesting. Mm. Let's, uh, let's see what... Uh... Anyway, we're almost... You have to here. send us that. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was out of the Aristotelian Society. Oh, okay. So, so we're almost... Like I, I want to read this guy um, because he's in both anthologies. We want to read somebody who tries to do truth makers, sorry, truth without truth makers. There's two options there. We can skim to see which one it should be. And then the Lewis uh, shotguns at the end. Oh, is that, in the, to, is that a section of the, the EJ Lowe anthology, Truth Without Truth Makers? No, the Truth Without Truth Makers are two different essays in the BB anthology. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'd and, love to do that. Yeah, and then the two, well, it's just one plus a postscript by Lewis where he says, here's how to do it if you go with modal realism. I want to end with that, but we don't have to. We can end with anything else or read anything else you like. But those are the only ones that I have on my list. So I'm, I'm convinced that the, the two main issues with truth making is uh, the modality issue, but then the other one being propositions. I think the nature of propositions is a big problem for truth making because that's going to introduce the problems with uh, entailment and the essentiality. Well, I think, and the essentiality. Um, um, well, I think there are reason why they're they're fraught, and maybe why they are so central, is because they're to do with truth, they're to do with modality, they they come up against universals in particular. As propositions are in everything, right? It seems like they're very importantly a central metaphysical notion but, of necessity because prop, they. Prop, have but their Kenny, spandrels in every but field. Kenny, jo jo Josh is really saying that he wants to give up correspondence for identity. He wants to say that uh, Russell was right the first time around. Yeah, okay. cleaned up a bit. Right. Bron, 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 I, I don't think that propositions are, are everywhere. I think proposition talk is everywhere. And I think that if you were to <laughs> solve the problem of propositions, you might get for free modality and truth making and a lot of stuff. But I mean, to, to I think to offer a different account of modality is going to do something to be like something like um, like Russell was was attempting to do. If he, he may have succeeded. I mean, I, right now I'm feeling like there's a future me that might be writing an article like Davidson saying somebody solved it, but nobody cared. <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> <laughs> instead of being about Tarski, it, it's, it's about Russell and propositions. Um, would, but would, I, you, I, would you follow Davidson and ending with, and so you see, there isn't really a <laughs> reason to expect a solution. So. <laughs> what more do you want? <laughs> what do you want from me? <laughs> You want a solution? <laughs> so naive. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no. So, so I, yeah. I, I, so let's I get something on the short list. Uh, yeah. It, like if you want to find something that speaks to that issue, I would know what it would be. It might be in the anthology. It might be somewhere else. And if you, Kenny or Karen, want to add something, uh, yeah. Otherwise, let's close out with the next three, and and then we move on to another topic. All righty. All right.